Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vanita Rodman Jenkins. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I direct the Spiker Rubin Women's Center for Equity and Diversity, uh, which is a co-sponsor of this event. In addition to BAFSO, I am the president, which is the BAFSO, Black Alumni Administrator, Faculty, Student, and Staff Organization. And we welcome you to the NJCU 2022 Black History Month celebration and opening. We are grateful that you have joined us today. Um, we are excited that even though we are still in the midst of unprecedented times, we are still able to have our program, which is a celebration of black history, of black resilience, and of black joy and certainly love. Um, I thank all of the co-sponsors for today's program. Uh, in addition to my two organizations, I'm grateful for the African and African American Studies Department, which is a co-sponsor, and the Lee Hagen Africana Study Center. Uh, and the new director is none other than Dr. Natasha Scruggs, who will come and give remarks and introduce our guest speaker for today. So welcome, welcome one, one and all. We look forward to you joining us for uh, the rest of the month to programs. Um, BAFSO members, we will be starting our general body meetings uh, Thursday, February 10th. So we look forward to seeing you not just this month, but throughout the academic year. So we wish you much love and much success, and we welcome Dr. Natasha Scruggs. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much to everybody who's joined us in the room today and to everyone who came to the flag raising ceremony. It was a little chilly, but our ancestors did it so we could do it, right? Thank you so much to everybody who's joining us through live stream as well. First, as always, I wanna acknowledge that NJCU sits on Lenny Lenape land and we respect those who came before us and their descendants who are still with us. As Vanita said, my name is Dr. Natasha Scruggs and I'm the new director of the Lee Hagen Africana Study Center. This is my very first uh, Black History Month here at NJCU and I'm looking forward to many more. First, um, I want to acknowledge where Black History Month came from because a lot of my students don't, don't know. We don't talk about it. We simply celebrate it. In 1926, for the first time, Negro History Week was celebrated. And this was thanks to the efforts of historian Dr. Carter G. Woodson. In addition to being the second black American to receive a doctorate from Harvard, Dr. Woodson dedicated his life to ensuring that the contributions black people have made to the United States are known. February was selected because it's the birth month of both Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln. Around 1970, many black people began celebrating the entire month, but we did not celebrate the month with national recognition until 1976, 26 years after Dr. Woodson's death. What started out as a seven-day celebration is now a 28-day celebration. I hope in my lifetime we'll see black history go more mainstream and be taught as exactly what it is, American history. You cannot talk about the United States without talking about black people. We first arrived in mass in 1619. That's two years before the arrival of the Mayflower. Just as the descendants of the pilgrims are seen as Americans and their rightful place in American history is never questioned, so should black Americans be seen as American and our rightful place in American history never questioned. No one needs to understand this more than black Americans. We have to always maintain confidence in our place and belonging in this society. Until the time comes when black history is told and taught as American history, we will continue to celebrate our resilience during the month of February in the spirit of Dr. Carter G. Woodson. And as we celebrate, those of us of African descent should challenge ourselves to move beyond surface understandings of who we are. 
We should never reduce our existence in the US to slavery and the civil rights movement. They are part of our history, but they do not define us completely. As quickly as we can name rappers and basketball players and actors and dance moves we've contributed to American society, I challenge us to remember the names and contributions of fellow black Americans who improve the lives of all Americans. Remember people like Garrett Morgan, who invented the gas mask and improved the traffic light. Sarah Boone, a former slave, one of the first black women in America to receive a patent, and the inventor of the modern ironing board. Thomas W. Stewart, inventor of the mop. John Albert Burr, inventor of the lawnmower. Philip B. Downing, who gave us the mailbox. Alexander Miles, the engineer who improved elevators by inventing doors that automatically open and close that we still use today. Thomas J. Martin, who invented the fire extinguisher. Remember the name Charles Drew, a black surgeon who improved the way we store blood, making it possible to save so many lives. Remember Bessie Coleman, the first black American woman to hold a pilot license in America, and the first black American to earn an international pilot's license. Remember Mae Jemison, a NASA astronaut, engineer, and physician, and the first black woman to travel to space. Remember Dr. Daniel Hale Williams, who founded the first black-owned hospital in America and performed the world's first successful heart surgery. And Louis Latimer, the only black American member of Thomas Edison's engineering lab. He invented the electric lamp and his ingenuity made the creation of light bulbs possible. People of African descent have helped to make this country what it is today with our inventions, our military service, countless cultural contributions, and even our generosity. According to the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, black Americans give 25% more of our income annually to organizations and causes than white households in America. This giving totals more than $11 billion each year. We need to always remember the inhumane treatment our ancestors had to endure and the tremendous sacrifices that were made by so many whose names we will never know so that we could have the opportunities we have today. When we reject false limitations about what we can accomplish, when we refuse to perpetuate negative stereotypes of who we are, when we refute the notion that we have a single story, and instead embrace our ability to achieve, heads held high, forward facing, reaching back only to harness the strength of our ancestors like steam for fuel when we get weary. We then truly personify the dream of those 400 million slaves who were freed in 1865 and wanted nothing more than for us to feel whole, live full lives, and claim our rightful place in the country they helped to build. Thank you so much for being here with us today as we celebrate for the next two years through the Lee Hagen Africana Study Center, the resilience of the African diaspora. It is with honor that I introduce my colleague, Dr. Jermaine McAlpin. Before he comes up, because he's modest, I'm gonna say a few words about him because his praises should be sung. Dr. Jermaine McAlpin is an internationally recognized expert and consultant on transitional justice, genocides, reparations, and truth commissions. He has traveled to South Africa, Cambodia, Armenia, and across the US and Canada presenting on the Armenian Genocide 
and reparations for slavery and Native American genocides. He's currently chair of the African and African American Studies Program here at NJCU. Dr. McAlpin was previously associate director of the Center for Caribbean Thought and lecturer of transitional justice in the Department of Government at the University of the West Indies, Mona. After attending the distinguished Calabar High School, he went on to the University of the West Indies, Mona, where he received a BS with first class honors in political science and international relations in 1999 and an MS in Comparative Government and Political Theory. Dr. McAlpin later earned his MA and PhD in Political Science in 2006 from Brown University. Dr. McAlpin specializes in Africana political philosophy, Caribbean political thought, and transitional justice. Without further delay, I give you my colleague, Dr. Jermaine McAlpin. Thank you so much, Dr. Scruggs and uh, Mrs. Vanida Jenkins. Um, it's my esteemed pleasure to be here to start this very important celebration that we call Black History Month, but it's really a contracted depiction of what it means to celebrate the world because the world proceeds from Africa. And so what I want to do in this address today is to talk about two African concepts from two different parts of Africa. Uh, Ubuntu, so between Ubuntu and Sankofa. So we're talking South Africa, Ubuntu, and Sankofa, uh, West Africa, particularly the Akan people in Ghana. Why this is important is so we understand that we can't move on without going back. And when we talk about history, we often think of history only as a recollection of the past without understanding the fundamental importance of history to our present. And so today I want to have a little conversation regarding honoring our ancestors. Not the pouring of libation to some homies, but really honoring our ancestors. How we understand ancestry and the importance of knowledge production through traditional African systems. I want to tell you what I'll be doing, and hopefully I'll be able to stick to it. And so where am I going in the presentation? I want to talk about the importance first of honoring our ancestors. Very importantly, what is Africa? We hear so many things about Africa and what Africa is and what Africa is not, and we only think of Africa using Chimamanda Adichie's The Dangers of a Single Story. We have compartmentalized what is Africa, and so our understanding is based on a single notion of a place that has 55 countries, 1.1 billion people, and over 3,000 ethnic groups. So it's important that we understand where we get the black from and the Africa from when we talk about uh, black history. I want to talk about the role of history and unity in honoring our ancestors. I also want to talk about Africa's importance to our diasporas. And fifth, I want to leave with you eight principles of the ancestors from Ubuntu to Sankofa. And then finally, where from here? What do we do with what we've just heard? And so bear with me, I crave your patience as I go through uh, these slides. It's important that when we talk about honor, we understand what honoring our ancestors mean. To honor is to confer a mantle of importance to the sacrifices of those who came before us. And so when we talk about honoring, we first have to acknowledge those who came before us. To honor is both retrospective, looking back in history, but it's also aspirational, looking forward and saying we can do this because it was done before. When we think of, as Dr. Scruggs mentioned, the resilience, that's not a 21st century creation, but it's actually 600 years in the making because our ancestors leaving from the western shores of Africa 
from the Bight of Benin, sailing to the Canary Islands and then coming southeast to the Americas, was 5,000 nautical miles, could take anywhere from three weeks to five months in subhuman conditions. So when we talk about resilience, we're talking about the African personality. And so to reach forward is aspirational. We are looking to a positive declaration of what the future is about. It would be remiss of me to not say welcome also to those who are viewing via our YouTube and Zoom platforms. But I want to give you a test. There is no presentation without a test if you're a professor. And so that's the test. I want to start off with a test, and I want to see how smart you all are, and feel free to answer. So this is the question. Let me see if you can get your mathematical calculations going. Between 1484 and 1880, how many slaves left Africa to come to the Americas and to Europe? Anyone wants to hazard a guess? Zero. Someone said zero. Anyone else? 500,000. 500, well, if you notice, I keep clicking, but nothing comes up. That's because it's zero. No slaves left Africa. The first thing we do to honor our ancestors is to rescue them from this identity. No slaves left Africa. 27 pe million people left Africa. 9 million made it to the Americas. So no slaves left Africa. So we have to first understand the honoring of our ancestors means to give them their proper identity. They were enslaved. To be a slave is a deterministic identity, but to be enslaved means that you are made into something you are not. And that's the first way we honor our ancestors. Right? A slave is a deterministic identity, but an enslaved is someone who was made into that. So no slaves came anywhere because no slaves left. Men, women, boys, girls, queens, kings, princes, artisans, and maybe some good-for-nothings. Let us be honest. But none of them were slaves. They were people. They were Mandingo, they were Koromanti, they were Akan, they were Ashanti, they were Wolof, they were Gikuyu, but they were not slaves. And so no slaves left Africa. So we honor our ancestors by understanding history. The great Marcus Garvey said, a people without knowledge of their history, origin, and past life is like a tree without roots. So if we don't know where we're coming from, we can't know where we're going. And if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. And so we have to rescue our ancestors from this inferior identity that says they were slaves, that says they were subhuman, that said that all they were equipped for by God was to be the hewers of wood and the drawers of water. We have to first change the language of our times to say the enslaved, the formerly enslaved, enslaved Africans, no slaves. So the idea of from Ubuntu to Sankofa, the word Ubuntu is Nguni, uh, and that's one of the South African languages. South Africa has 11 official languages, and it is from the Zulu people. Note, we don't say tribes. That's the other thing you should be educated about. They are ethnic groups. They are peoples. There are no tribes in Africa. They've never called themselves tribes. They call themselves people, clans, families. They never call themselves tribes. There is no translation in any African language of the word tribe. And so the Zulu people have an expression, umuntu, gumuntu, gabanta. And this is what it's translated. Now, that's me in my younger, more handsome self. Uh, 20 years ago, learning from Archbishop Desmond Tutu the concept of Ubuntu. And when we talk about Ubuntu, it's not just a word. It is a philosophy. 
And that's why we're moving from Ubuntu to Sankofa. So what is Ubuntu, you may ask? Depicted with this circle unbroken with the feet of these young men, you see these concepts. Ubuntu means we are only people through other people. In other words, your humanity is diminished when you attempt to diminish mine. So you can't be human if you dehumanize me. That's the idea of Ubuntu. And that's how we begin to honor our ancestors. Ubuntu means that there is a oneness to humanity. When we talk about Ubuntu, we're talking about oneness, togetherness. To put it very simple, it is I am because you are. That's all it is. That's the concept of Ubuntu. We honor our ancestors by doing Ubuntu, oneness through humanity. To put it another way, the wellness of the community is tied to the wellness of individuals. If the community is broken, the individual is broken. If the individual is broken, the community is broken. I think the Manhattans said it best, there's no me without you. I know they were talking a girl, but when we think of Ubuntu, that's what it means. There's no me without you. That is what it means to I am because we are. And so we get to this juncture of understanding history and the role of history in our present. It was Renoko Rashidi that said perhaps the greatest crime that one can commit is to teach a black child that their history begins with slavery. Recorded history accounts for the African genesis of humanity 5.6 million years ago. That man, not Homo erectus, but Homo sapien, develops in Africa and begins to migrate across the world 60,000 years ago. So it's not undeveloped man that leaves Africa and starts the migration that leaves people here in the Americas 15,000 years ago. It is man fully developed, having the resourcefulness to build civilization. So we have to know history in order to understand who we are. You can't honor what you don't know. And my favorite, and I hate saying African proverb, find out where in Africa it's from. It's offensive to say this African proverb. So the Ewemina people are from Benin, Ghana, and Togo, West Africa. And this is my favorite of all the proverbs from the continent. Until the lion gets his own storyteller, the story of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. Who tells the lion's story? Who tells the African's story? Who tells the story of conquest, oppression, exploitation, dehumanization, and finally enslavement? In other words, we honor our ancestors from Africa to the present by telling the story from their perspective. If all we hear is that these people uh, captured other people that look like them and sold, us, sold them into slavery without understanding and being honest that slavery was a well-known institution that was universal, but it did not take on racialized tones until Europeans arrived on the shore of Africa starting in 1454. So we have to understand history before we can honor those who we call ancestors. So we are moving from Ubuntu, from the oneness of humanity, to Sankofa. Sankofa is here represented in two depictions by the bird with the body facing forward and the head going back. And this one is from the Akan people in West Africa. And it is depicted as one of the many Akan symbols, Adinkra symbols, and it indicates that there is connectivity of the past to the present. Literally, the phrase Sankofa comes from this Akan phrase, 
And you can see there, so we were fin awosanko for a Yankee, which simply means it's never a taboo to return and fetch it. In other words, to move to the present, we have to go back to the past. So we should always remember that we have to learn from the past. So the symbolism of the bird is that the body is facing forward, but the head is back. And in some depictions, you see an egg. And that is the future. The egg is in the mouth of the Sankofa bird. So how do we balance the past and the present? We often have five responses to the past. We either forget it existed, we never learn from it, we despise it, we love it so much we dwell on it and want to return, or fifth, we learn from it and build on its lessons. And that is how we honor our ancestors. So if we think of uniting Ubuntu and Sankofa, we have to understand the importance of community and collective humanity. In other words, it's not just a sentimental recollection for Black History Month, but recalling history is to lead to social change. If we can't change who we are as a people, if we can't change the world in which we live, then we have failed our ancestors. They gave us the power of resilience. They gave us the power of hard work. They gave us the power of genesis and origin. So what is Africa? And that's where I want to move quickly as we are pressed for time. What is Africa? Africa is not a country. And you may say, well, yeah, we know that, but many persons still don't know. Africa is not a country. And I can't emphasize it enough. I hear people travel to Africa. I'm not sure where they're traveling to, which one of the 55 countries. But Africa is not to be singularized. It is the most complex and diverse place on earth. Ethnically, in terms of biodiversity, all of the aspects of diversity, Africa is significant. So just a rehearsal, it's the second largest and second most populous continent. Africa consists of between 1,250 to 2,100 languages. I didn't say dialects, I said languages. Distinct, unique languages and over 3,000 distinct ethnic groups, not tribes. There are no tribes, they are ethnic groups, they are people. And that's a picture of Africa. You may not be able to see it very well, but if you look at the depiction, you see the diversity, that there are islands. So Madagascar is not just a cartoon animated series, but it's an actual island. Uh, on the Indian side, uh, Indian Ocean side of Africa, that there are 54 independent countries and one disputed country, uh, the Western Sahara. And you have all of that diversity. If you look at the map, most of the ancestors that left the continent of Africa left from the Bight of Benin just to the west where you see Guinea all the way down to Angola. 95% of the enslaved Africans came from that uh, 3,000 mile coast. And so that is how diverse they were. One set of people didn't arrive here. Different people came here because they came from different parts of the earth. Africa is often perceived as very small because we also lie with maps. Cartography is not a neutral science. The making of maps is not neutral. Africa is depicted as much smaller than it is. Well, those are the countries that can be held in Africa. All of China. China has 1.45 billion people. All of India. India has 1.23 billion people. All of East, uh, Southern Europe, Japan, UK, Eastern Europe, the US, Canada, they can all be held in Africa. That's how big a landmass it is. But Africa is diminished in size because of our understanding that it is more convenient to think of it as a single space and a space of no innovation. 
So I want to quickly move to the role of unity in understanding Ubuntu to Sankofa. And I want to talk quickly about the case for black solidarity. So what is black solidarity? Because oftentimes when we talk about honoring the ancestors, we often say we must have solidarity. But what is solidarity? It is the unity that must emerge from our common ancestry, our common status, and our common destiny. It is the linking of groups premised on what unites us rather than what divides us. And so it's important that we understand that. So black solidarity means that your nationality is American, your race is black, your ethnicity may be Latinx or Caribbean, your politics must be black empowerment, and Black Lives Matter is not a race call, but a people's call. Malcolm X said it well, that there can be no black-white unity until there is first black unity. We cannot think of uniting with others until we are first united among ourselves. We cannot think of being acceptable to others until we have proven first acceptable to ourselves. And that is what black dignity is about. When you know the great civilizations from which your ancestors come, then that should give you recourse to think that you're not just a black N-word, you're actually someone who can make a change in the world. And so, we have to understand that black solidarity is a call to collapse our differences into sameness. We have a common cause, and that is black power. And before you get excited or agitated, black power is what I call a process of radical somodification. It is to make black people into someone, not beings, not subhuman not things, but black power is about black dignity. So what does black power do? Black power creates dignity through empowerment. It constructs a space of freedom through collective action, and it posits a return to cultural integrity. And we have to understand that. Fourth, Black power is about ownership. And fifth, black power is about education for social change. Our existence did not begin with slavery and it cannot end with racism. And so, as I close, how do we honor our ancestors? I want to use these eight uh, principles. Seven of them are from West Africa specifically from the Akan people, and one, Ubuntu, is from South Africa. So how do we honor our ancestors? First, Ubuntu, we have to focus on building communities defined by unity. Right? That's the first thing about Ubuntu, and unity here is not just racial, it's also people, right? Uniting people for a common cause. Second, it's the principle of fiancra, and that's an adinkra symbol that expresses wholeness or completeness. In other words, we honor our ancestors by breaking cycles of intergenerational trauma and victim identities. A slave is a victim identity. We were enslaved people but we are not slaves. So we have to break intergenerational trauma that says that this is as far as people of African descent can go. Third, it's the principle of Akoben, another Adinkra symbol that indicates a call to reparation or to repair. In other words, we honor our ancestors by advocating for and agitating for historic repair. We must repair what is broken. We must piece together the fragments of identity. And the fourth principle is bin bin ka bi, which in the Adinkra 
concept means justice or freedom. In other words, we honor our ancestors by creating or forging alliances for justice. Right? And that goes above and beyond race because as Dr. King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And so we have to forge links for justice. Fifth, Okodi, and that depicts strength. In other words, we honor our ancestors by ensuring that the lioness can tell her own story. The story is not told by others, but that we can tell our own story. And sixth, Nia Onin, and that symbol means knowledge and lifelong education. We must educate ourselves. With not, I didn't say school, we must educate ourselves. That even in and out of school, we educate ourselves about who we are and where we are going. That's how we honor our ancestors. And that symbol says, education for transformation rather than conformity. You should not be educated to conform to systems passed down to you. You should be educated to transform and to revolutionize the systems of oppression that have kept people in all sorts of injustices. And seventh, Ntesi Matemasi, and that Adinkra symbol epitomizes wisdom and knowledge. In other words, you must have a cultural connection to the traditions of Africa. Not wearing a shirt and say, this is my tribal outfit. No. This is honoring the ancestors who wove the fabric, who transported textile 3,000 miles across the sea, and to who we owe who we are today. And finally, Sankofa. We must teach history as the basis of social transformation and not as a disconnection from the past. In other words, history is alive and living. We don't believe in dead history. History is alive and living. And finally, where do we go from here? The most effective honoring of our ancestors is to first learn from the past, second, use it as a guide to transformation, third, make it an instrument of solidarity, fourth, ground or advocacy of justice in traditions of unity, and fifth, see the dignity of an African identity. That's how we honor our past. Honoring our ancestors is a dignity project. Malcolm X says, we declare our right on this earth to be a human being, to be respected as a human being, to be given the rights of a human being in this society, on this earth, in this day, which we intend to bring into existence by any means necessary. That's the full quote. So we fight against racism and all forms of bigotry. We work for justice. We promote the oneness of humanity. We choose to be unapologetically black and African with dignity. And we decide to support and advocate for movements that work for economic and social justice. And you may not get a table set for you. You may not even get a chair but I love what Shirley Chisholm says. If they don't give you a seat at the table, take a folding chair. Thank you very much. I always love Shirley Chisholm quotes. She had the best. I just want to thank everybody for, again, for joining us today, those of you here in person and those of us who joined us on live streaming. Um, as Vanita said, please check out the programming that BAFSO will be sponsoring and also the Women's Center 
Um, and also please check out the Lee Hagen Africana Study Center social media. We have events coming up. Too many to even say right now. Uh, Brianna, who works in the center, has already made all the postings for each event. And there's also a master calendar for all of February, so you can tune in and join us. We thank you so much. We thank you, Dr. McAlpin. Every time he gives a talk, it's engaging and no one wants to leave. <laughs> so thank you so much. We look forward to um, having future events with you. And again, remember, we honor our ancestors by living in the present, only reaching back to the past for that strength that they left for us to move forward and keep moving on. Thank you so much. Let's keep celebrating the resilience of the African diaspora.